If I were not allowed to write, if I were put away, as they say in Ireland, uh, I think I'd probably go mad. <laughs> I wasn't the only person to be banned. I, I'd like to mention a lot of international authors were. But mine made something of a stir, if not to say an annoyance, because I was young and I was a woman. And there wasn't a tradition of women or young women or any age women writing. And also the book was set in a part of Ireland where I come from, County Clare, and a convent in County Galway. So it had an immediacy for people. And what was thought was that I had, I had uh, betrayed my own country and I had depicted, I had, my depiction of women, it said, was a smear, that great word, a smear on Irish womanhood. And then there was a little burning in my village. The priest asked for copies to be brought in. There were only two copies. And my mother was very um, upset and everyone I got anonymous letters. People were very cross with me. They felt I had ridiculed them, which of course is not the case. It's not a book about ridicule. It's two young girls bursting with life, one poetic and one ribald. And I was afraid, but at the same time, I was determined eventually, not in the heat of the few months when publication happened, I was determined that I would write another book and another book and another. But when it happened, first of all, when you write, and especially when you write your first book, you don't think of anyone. You don't think of anything, only those words. You live in that world, as I did. I had moved to London. I had two small children, and I was married. And I had never realized, I couldn't because I was, I, that Ireland meant so much to me. And the cut, the separation, when I arrived at Waterloo Station with my children, uh, any foliage, not that there's much in Waterloo Station, or birds, everything seemed mechanical or man-made. Nature, it seemed so alien to me. And it was Christmas time, or November, and I was given a commission to write The Country Girls by a publisher, uh, Knopf in America, Blanche Knopf and Hutchinson and I was given the noble sum of 50 pounds, 25 pounds each. I spent this money immediately. That money went, I bought things for my children. I bought a sewing machine to, to appease my husband. I've never used a sewing machine in my life and never will now. So the money was gone and the book had to be written. And I sat down at the windowsill after my children went to school in the morning and I just wrote, I, write, I still write by hand in little copy books. And I wrote, it wrote itself. And all I know was that I felt a great energy and at the same time a sadness that was, it was so deep. I, I cried and cried and yet the book has a, a humor to it and a kind of gaiety to it. And uh, it was finished in three weeks. So what should have been a wonderful debut, shall we call it, is that the word? turned out to be, in private, a fairly troubled one. But at the same time, it got published. I'm from that parish in County Clare, Toom Graney, and I grew up in a, in a village where there weren't any books, but there were prayer books, and there were stories, and there was the fervor for language. So I uh, had both a wonderful growing up and a not wonderful growing up. No family, as Tolstoy would probably agree with, no family is particularly happy. And although we didn't have books, we had some mythology and poetry at school, in the class. And I knew all those descriptions of Ireland as being the gaunt hag of bear was the poor Ireland that was starving. Joyce had called Ireland the sow that eats its farrow. Poems to Ireland, Ireland was always addressed as a woman 
But I always, from the earliest age, had this love of words and literature, even though I didn't know what literature was about. I think every Irish writer is influenced and overawed and both trampled on and, what's the word, excited by Joyce. He's so great. Joyce is the constellation. Joyce is heaven and earth. It was, I love Joyce, and it was the first book I ever bought. It was a little book, uh, T.S. Eliot introducing James Joyce for fourpence in the Keys in Dublin. And I read the opening passage of the chapter in Portrait of the Artist of a Christmas dinner. And it's all very happy and benign and harmonious and there's drink and decanters and the table is laid and the fire is lit. And then suddenly there's eruption on account of two things, sex and politics, the two big bogies of every country, but especially Ireland. And when I read that, I felt, ah, oh, he's going to be my education. He's going to teach me how to write. Now, I could never approach his greatness, but he did teach me how to write. Plus, when I went on to read Ulysses, he taught me, as he would you or anyone, how, you know, the things you can do with language. Language is such a great pasture. You can write very simply, you can write very audaciously, you can write, uh, you can lay on the prose and then puncture it as he does. You know, somewhere there's a sense, uh, touch me soft eyes, I am lonely here, and it's very lyrical. And then Joyce says, where the blue hell was I? So he's a, he's a master, he's a total master. One could read a bit of Ulysses every day and learn from it. I need to write, yes. I need to, even though I fear it, I don't fear the need, I fear the doing of it. Because it makes one very, very anxious and it's all this. There's no let up. A dentist or a pastry cook can stop being a dentist when it's seven o'clock. When you're writing, it's, it's always with you. It's abiding in you, you know? And the need, I think, as I have said, I said it last night, it's as if there is something I could say if I could find the exact unfindable words. And what I find when I am writing, and it's going fairly well, and the language and the sentences and everything have their, have their flight, or are earthed, depending on the material and the moment of, uh, of this narrative. I am then very happy. I'm then very happy, and I'm very unaware of anything else in the world, or of anyone else. That is the good bit. The less good bit is to get to that state. Because each day when you start, you start again. And I always think, and this is not in any way to denigrate poetry, because I love poetry. But where poetry is easier in one sense is the duration of time. Any poet will tell you it, it, a poem might take no more than three months to write. A novel will take a minimum three years to write, minimum. And the language has to be as attentive and as hopefully as musical as it would be in a poem. Uh, even though I, having already said it's a hard vocation, it's, if I couldn't do it, I talk of strange, sacrificial, throttled women, I would feel throttled. And, um, I'm very thankful for my own genes and genealogy, for my country, for all my various little quarrels with it. I'm very thankful that I somehow have been given that gift. And I have been given the gift, and I touch wood to hope that I can retain that gift. But I have also been given particular circumstances very good for a writer. It's easier to assemble everything to write if you grow up in a small place, in a country place, you have access, you know what's happening. You even know what's happening before, before you know it. You know, you sense it. Whereas living in a city, if I were, my parents, for instance, when they got married, lived in Brooklyn. If I'd grown up in Brooklyn, well, my books would be very different. I don't know whether they'd be better or worse, but they would be different. 
And um, I also, at a very practical, uh, rather vulgar note, it's my livelihood. I live by my writing, which isn't exactly a halcyon time. Uh, so everything conspires and transpires to my being, to my doing it. I worry about literature, to tell you the truth, as any thinking serious person does. It is not as loved and uh, appreciated in the general world. If, for instance, Faulkner or Virginia Woolf published a book tomorrow, a great book, they might be lucky to sell 5,000 copies, unless they went on Oprah Winfrey or something, and then it hit. But, and the worry is that with so many other things, music, rap, noise, television, noise, 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 the concentration and the dedication, not just to write a book, but to read a book, is much less. To read a book, you have to be, you have, it's not that it's studying like one did at school, but one has to enter into it. You have to enter into that world. And to do that, you have to be, well, you have to love it, but you also have to give your time to it. Whereas a more, it's a more restless world. Everything is moving, moving, moving. Short stories give you a freedom. They also give you um, a limitation. You know, you have to keep within that, not formula, but it's not a novel. And I wanted to write, as I have done down the years, about women, mothers, sisters, one aspect of the collection. And the other aspect was to address the situation in Ireland in the last decade, as I saw it, and I saw it very clearly, because I go there a lot. And when you say uh, that Americans want the vision of Ireland that's more nostalgic and like the quiet man, I think there's room for everything. And I would also, I think, want to say that it is how something is written. It is the language, the style, and the power that matters in a piece of fiction. That's why I always draw a distinction between work that's depressing and work that is deeply sad. Depressing is just depressing. And in the case of the two stories, Inner Cowboy especially, and Send My Roots Rain, I, there is indeed a lot about the Irish, the, the, one, the moguls, the ones who made the money and coined it and had all the appendages of, of great wealth. And they are contrasted with the opposite, who were still there, and that is the more poetic ones, the more innocent ones. It is a spiritual as well as a secular thing. It has a holiness of a kind in it. And when people are very lonely, or when something important happens to them. They often, as they might to prayer, they turn to poetry or prose. And I've noticed that again and again. I'm not just saying that in a sentimental uh, oration. I'm saying it because I know that it's true. We live a great deal in our minds as individuals. And that is where literature hits home. Other things don't, not nearly as much. Literature does. And often uh, the characters in fiction, Anna Karenina or, or Hans Kastrop in The Magic Mountain, they feel as near to me. And I feel I know them as well as people that I know. A scandalous woman. Oh, I got into hot water for that two hours. It was a land of shame. Oh, boy. <gasps> now, she kissed me and put a little holy water on my forehead, delving it in deeply as if I were dough. They waved to us, and my son could not return those waves, encumbered as he was with the various presents that both the children and Eile had showered on him. It was beginning to spot with rain, and what with that, and the holy water and the red rowan bright and instinct with life. I thought that ours indeed was a land of shame a land of murder and a land of strange throttled 
sacrificial women. They didn't like that. <laughs> So James X out here stops at one point, you know, in, this, in the story and unburdens himself and gives back to society what society put on him. Simple and straight. The telling of that tale and the voicing of the issue of the abuse is profound in that it deals with something that has been hidden both in an Irish context on sexuality and then doubly then because it was sexual attack on a child. It's huge. It has huge repercussions. Well, I suppose to put Letterfrack into context, you know, in, for, for an American public, I suppose if you took, you know what I mean, the Gulag Archipelago, or you took Stalin's, you know, whole network of systems, and then you took the issues uh, that are very much uh, to the fore in America, Guantanamo Bay and waterboarding, and then you took, you know, um, you know, places like, you know, Sing Sing and, you know, the most harshest of these uh, jails. Uh, and you were to combine them all together. Uh, and then you were to place them in a very isolated place in the farthest, farthest west coast of Ireland in Connemara, the furthest point uh, from America across the Atlantic. And then you were to actually, rather than adults being in these, in places. You, you had children in there who were on thousands of acres of land. This is what it was. Letterfract was a compound. It was a hard labour camp for children. It was a place where children arrived being condemned by a series of documents. Some of them are on the wall here, some of them are in these books here. So by the time the children arrived in Letterfract, uh, under warrant from the courts, uh, they were regarded as rubbish children. They had no rights, they weren't regarded, and they weren't protected. Letterfract held around 270 children from the ages of seven to about 13. Uh, the place was uh, run by the Christian brothers who ruled the uh, whole um, school uh, and the 8,000, or whatever it was, thousands of acres of land by sheer brute violence. The only comparison to that violence that I would uh, know about would have been in the Nazi concentration camps and certainly in the Pol Pot uh, hard labour camps and in the, the labour uh, camps of uh, Mousy Tongue. It's on par with them. That's the way the system is. Letterfrack was just one of, you know, you know, in the region of maybe a, a hundred odd of these places. You know, there were, there were girls' ones, there were young children's ones, there were Magdalene laundries, they were scattered throughout the country. They were mainly controlled by the religious congregations, 18 of them, and they were used to extract labour from children in order to make profit for the various religious organisations. Well, where, where was I in Letterfrack? Um, I suppose to explain that, you know what I mean, before you arrived in Letterfrack, from the class that I came from and the sensibility that I came from uh, and the environment that I came from and the country that I came from, you were in Letterfrack because you were in the threat of it. And Ireland was a place of threat. There was always this foreboding thing. You know, there was always the sexual thing closed down, there was the body thing closed down and there was always these authorities and these bells going off in the background. And there was these authority figures that were there, and it was all closed down, certainly growing up in Ireland in the 50s. John McGahan talks about this, a fabulous writer who talks about this. Edna O'Brien touches on this. But we quickly romanticised these things and turned them into something else. We never really examined them. So where was I in letter frack? As I say again, you know, I, mean, I was very conscious when I, you know, I became conscious of where I was and the restrictions. You were very young. You were 400 miles away from home in a completely rural environment with a very, very strange group of individuals who were all half starved. And the only thing you had to look into was that internal space. The only thing you had to look into that situation was that, I suppose, that other longing that was always there from the dawn of time. Who am I? What am I? What is this? 
you always are trying to move towards the light. It must have been in the conscious. And I just had to protect that situation as I moved through all the physicality of the place and all the threat of the place. I had a, a loving family. My mother and father were very loving to me. Things were difficult, but they did their best. My family was a loving family. I loved my family and they loved me. I had a, I had a good environment. Poor it was, certainly, there was a, quite a lot of it, but we had a loving environment and we were looked after to the best of our ability. So I had this other memory. I, I had nurture, you know what I mean? I, I had, you know, warmth. So you always are moving towards that. You're always trying to get that. And your, your protection and your light becomes rather essence. It becomes like almost nuclear. You're holding on to the minutest of things the smallest of things, as you're isolated from your group, from who you are, from what you are, and nothing has comfort. And this is what they did. That's the breakdown that they had, because we were not regarded, not regarded, not regarded as a human being, you know, and turn you into just basically, you know, matter. But for the magic and the mystery of what life is, that ingredient never went out. Never went out. Not possible to extinguish that. Not possible to extinguish that. And that's what was interesting. So when you ask me, where was I in Letterfrack? This is the place that I was in Letterfrack. And that place that I had as a child, being born, running around with my family, that light never was extinguished. That light is here today in New York City. Same light. We know from the documents that upwards of 170,000 to 200,000 children went through this system. That while the English, you know, were enlightened and wanted to get rid of the system under their watch and managed to do that. In 1922, when Ireland uh, became independent, well, the, the, the Republic of Ireland, the Catholic Church quickly uh, uh, made more of these institutions and got control. So the church and the state were hand in glove in the incarcerating, uttering, and indifference, uh, and class control of vast amounts of people. But what they did is they crucified them and they closed them down behind closed doors. They destroyed tens of thousands of lives in their Magdalene laundries, in their residential institutions, and they still have not been brought to account for that. Here's Ireland, romantic Ireland, the wonderful green land, the place that struggled hard for its freedom, crucifying its very, very poor. You know what I mean? In, in actual fact, betraying the very, very thing that it said, that it would give succor, that it would have regard, and that the children would, would, would be regarded on e on, with, with inequality. It didn't. The middle classes turned their backs on them, and the working classes were held straight down, right down. So it became a class issue. The beneficiaries of this were Catholic Irish middle classes who got their clothes washed and didn't have to see these poor. And everybody covered it all up, and the artist, the culturists, the ones who are creating the work, it's our business to make sure that this light does not go out. And in recent times, I believe that Irish artists have not brought this to the forefront. They've gone into a kind of a peculiar sort of entertainment, a peculiar kind of like, you know, almost kind of caricature version of themselves. They've fallen into this romantic kind of Irish, high diddly d uh, kind of like, you know, isn't it great, we're so culturist. And it's bullshit. It's nonsense. With all due respect, what it is, it's cultural commodity. It's cultural product to sell books. But when you examine down the lot, you don't really get an insight of what's going on in society. Because who would imagine Ireland? Take a look around the walls. These walls tell you about torture. They tell you about the rape, torture, and murder of the soul. And this murder, rape, torture of the soul was done by those who had professed no greater glory, no greater love than the love of God, the true me that I give you, and the opposite happened. But there's nothing like the confirmation you get when you read a piece of literature or when you reflect something, when there's a, a marking in a cave which goes, wow, they're, they're, you know, I, I, I am here, I, I'm here. This is what was not confirmed in Ireland. We were never allowed to be present. We were never allowed to be individuals, and we turned ourselves into a group of characters and caricatures. It sparks off a kind of resentment from other artists and other individuals who think that I'm just writing an autobiography. 
oh, that's just his story. You know, he's not kind of doing that. Anybody can write their story. You, but you, when you start to fuse it with all of the other ingredients, anybody can bake bread, but not much of it's going to be edible. When I wrote this book, Nothing to Say, I wrote it directly for the people who I had met in my childhood in the institution so they could read that and reflect. When I, when I went into politics as an elected representative, I went in in order to reflect back into my own community that this you know, could be done, that it wasn't the Wizard of Oz, there was nothing to be afraid of, that there was, this was just all cardboard. But we'd been conditioned. It was a bit like you know, the Truman Show. Working classes are held in this kind of Truman Show environment. It's kind of bubbled off. We don't see down the road. We see them as posh people. We see them as kind of, you know, well-heeled. We don't see the prejudice. We don't see the confinement or the containment. In my life, everything in my life, okay, and in my background would say, you know, that this was a disaster, that this was a, a person who was going to die very early, very young, that, you know, there was no education, all that. But the opposite came out. It didn't come out because I had any special ingredient or I had like three hands or a, or a third brain. It came out because I stepped into the journey and had the opportunity to own what had happened and to examine what had happened and why. So one day you pick up a pen, you get a blank piece of paper and three months down the road you've got a play or you've got a book or ten years down the road this is what you got. Despite yourself. That's what this thing is. That's really what it is. It's not about becoming a writer. It's about writing. It's about doing it.